So welcome all. This is the Russian session of our half day long virus and freedom of expression, China, Turkey and Russia seminar. Um, my name is Mirai Yeshil. I am a third year undergraduate student in London, majoring in European politics. And I will be your host in this session, as well as the close and remarks session of this program. So uh, for this session, we are going to have three speakers in the order of Dr. James Rogers, Gurnoza Said and Sofia Orlovsky. For those of you who were not with us during the previous sessions, I'll go over some of the house rules. So each speaker will be given 15 minutes to talk. Um, then we will have another 15 minutes for Q&A. We wanted this to be as interactive as possible and that is why we are using Zoom meetings rather than Zoom webinar. So please feel free to use the chat box to share your views and any criticism you may have. Uh, when it comes to asking questions, we prefer that you ask your question yourself. Um, but as you are muted now, you will have to remind me that you have a question to ask. And you can do that by raising your hand or writing to me through the chat box. So without taking more of your precious time, I will shortly introduce our first speaker for this session. Uh, Dr. James Rogers is a reader in international journalism responsible for the MA International Journalism at the City University of London. Uh, before entering journalism academia in 2010, James was a journalist for 20 years. He spent 15 years at the BBC completing correspondent postings in Moscow, Brussels and Gaza, as well as many other assignments. His particular areas of interest in international journalism are Russia and the former Soviet Union and the Middle East. The title of his speech is Russia's battle against COVID-19 within the context of its attempts to influence and control the way its story is told around the world. Uh, James, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope everyone can, uh, can hear me okay. Um, and thank you very much for the invitation to take part today. I was able to join some of the earlier sessions and it seems to have been a really, really interesting day. Um, Russia's treatment of international correspondence is the story of its relations with the West. The arrival in Russia of the coronavirus has highlighted some very interesting points about the capability which the Kremlin has to control the foreign press and the limit of that capability. Now I'm going to talk mostly today about international media, but I want to make special mention before I do that of the many talented, dedicated and courageous journalists who've come from Russia and who in the current political climate in particular, often work in very difficult circumstances. And I think, you know, members of the audience will know the current, the recent changes of the Edomacy are just one recent example. And the deaths of investigative reporters over the years are reminders uh, of some of the dangers uh, of working in the former Soviet Union. But I'm going to argue today that Russia's political leaders currently are very confident on the international stage even lift like elites the world over they're struggling to cope with the health, economic and political consequences of the pandemic. But they increasingly want to tell the story themselves rather than try to influence the way that it's told, but they realize that there are limits uh, as to how much they can do that. But I want to do make my argument by putting the situation today into some historical context. I've just published a book on the way that Russia has been reported in the West over the last hundred years. So I'm not going to give you a whole massive long history lesson, uh, but I am going to go back and start very briefly uh, in 1917 with the first of the two revolutions that shook Russia that year, because there's a very interesting moment there about political communication and the way that journalism then could be controlled. And the reason I say that was because um, when the Tsar, the Russian emperor was first taken from power, when he first abdicated, the new government, the provisional government, managed to keep that from the world. They closed off the telegraph, and in those days, closing off the telegraph links to the rest of the world was a very efficient way of making sure that no news got out. In my recent research, I discovered a really interesting article from uh, the Daily Mail, which pretty much goes against everything I tried to tell my journalism students, uh, because the headline was No News from Russia. Now, of course, the fact that there was no news was significant. Everybody guessed that something was up. But the point was that then by cutting off the telegraph, the government could cut the entire country off from the world. Impossible to imagine nowadays, uh, but a, a time when uh, the government, the political power could be completely in charge of what was going on. Um, so, uh, as I say, they, they, that, was, that was something which had the Daily Mail's editors fretting um, 
as they waited for news. Now, the whole of the Soviet period from 1917 until the Soviet Union ended in 1991 were a variety of approaches which were used to control um, the international media. Firstly, as some people may well know, it was a different system if the correspondent was either from a communist country or from a communist media. In other words, so publications uh, like the Morning Star or the Daily Worker or the Tribune in Canada, the correspondents there were not, did not deal directly with the, um, with the foreign ministry as, as correspondents do now, but they actually had a, a handler or a contact uh, in the Central Committee of the Communist Party. So that was one way. Uh, and if those, those more favored correspondents were also in some ways given uh, better access. There are also times of relative openness. If you think about, uh, this is quite hard to imagine in Russia now, but um, the general secretary in the 1950s, um, Khrushchev, uh, Nikita Khrushchev, actually would go to diplomatic cocktail parties. So if the embassies of all the different countries around the world would have their national day, uh, the United States embassy would obviously celebrate the 4th of July. He would go along uh, and chat to, um, to correspondents. Um, there's lots of accounts of these in people's memoirs. Um, but there's also, I was also interviewed um, one man who's very sadly since he died late last year, Robert Elphick, who was a correspondent for Reuters there uh, in the 1950s. And he said that Khrushchev would come along because they were very keen to engage with the Western media because getting quoted in the international media was also a means of getting political kudos at home. So we saw something similar during the uh, perestroika and glasnost reforms of Mikhail Gorbachev in the 1980s. But there have also been times of a lot of suspicion, suspicion of espionage, of correspondence being suspected of being spies, quite rightly on some occasions, by the way, and also of correspondence being spied upon. Correspondence have been expelled on at least one occasion. Uh, they've even been detained, uh, it, 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 as it turned out, for uh, exchange um, with, with people uh, in the, detained in the West. There are also times of severe limits on press freedom right throughout the Soviet period. And I think perhaps the uh, most extreme of those were times of famine uh, in Ukraine in the 1930s and also during World War II, um, when there were a few correspondents who were permitted to be in Moscow uh, but um, most of them were kept, um, kept there and not allowed to travel around apart from when the Soviet uh, authorities wanted to show when they'd scored uh, a great victory, uh, uh, particularly at the Battle of Stalingrad. Um, that all changed and I think this is a, possibly one of the most interesting moments um, in Russian journalistic history which still reverberates today. Uh, was in the 1990s. Um, at the end of the Soviet period saw a real flourishing of the freedom of the press uh, and I'm going to argue that the, the wars in Chechnya, I think, at the t of which there were two um, in the 1990s, one uh, from late 1994 broadly to 1996 and again from 1999 to 2000. Um, I think those two conflicts were key events because of what they said about press freedom and, and also I think they also um, set some of these, prepared, paved the way for some of the situation which we find today. Um, if you talk to correspondents who covered that first war in 1994 to 1996, just for people who don't remember, uh, Chechnya, which is a southern part of the Russian, southern region of the Russian Federation, uh, fought these two separatist conflicts for independence from Moscow in the in the late 19 in the in the mid and late 1990s. Um, it was an extremely um, it was it was a conflict in which many many people lost their lives. Uh, the estimates are, are imprecise, but tens of thousands of civilians, uh, it is generally agreed, uh, along with a lot of conscript Russian soldiers who were ill prepared for the battle which they were being sent to. From a media point of view, perhaps the most interesting thing about uh, the way that this conflict was covered was the total freedom that media were given, Russian media and also international media. You talk to international correspondents from that time, they both, they will often use the phrase a free for all. In fact, the only restriction really on journalists then uh, was their own sense of danger uh, and, and how, because a number of journalists inevitably were killed uh, in that conflict and, and it was extremely dangerous. Um, but a lot of the, uh, and I think there are two reasons for this. Firstly, because of the, the chaotic nature of the conflict. Uh, the Russian government at the time under Boris Yeltsin, the defense minister had confidently said that they could take control of the main city there, Grozny, uh, within two hours. That turned out to be very far from the case. Um, 
and so there was there was a lot of danger there but there was also um, I think in the government at the time, I think there was a genuine commitment to press freedom. And it was an understanding that we might not like all the reporting that we're getting, uh, but I think there was an understanding then that this was something that, that was part of Russia's drive then uh, to uh, become, to, to form itself as a democracy after the years, uh, the decades of Marxism, Leninism. Now I was among the correspondents who covered that conflict and certainly it was extremely dangerous. Um, but there was a sense that a lot of you know activity of normal free reporting was largely tolerated. Now, what happened between 1995 and 1999 was that um, Yeltsin left power and Vladimir Putin's rise uh, to, to prominence um, uh, began. I, I think I'm right in saying it was uh, 21 years ago uh, this month that he first um, became Russian Prime Minister and then eventually um, acting president and then eventually president. So Putin, I think, and the way that he, um, this was a man who was barely known in the summer of 1999 and yet in the spring of 2000 he was elected president and one way he did that was by getting tough um, on the, in the wars in Chechnya and one way that Russia also did that was by placing much greater controls uh, on the press. And, I'm, and I would argue that this was the beginning of an attempt to, to place greater controls on the press overall. Russia did not like the reporting of civilian casualties which resulted from that earlier conflict and was determined uh, not to see that repeated. So um, this is, we have seen over the last few years, a, a steady move, and I think there's also been a move, a change of tactics as well, because when Putin first came uh, to be president and his first term as president, there were echoes of that approach uh, pioneered by Khrushchev, which was that if you engage with the international media and also by Gorbachev, if you engage with the international media, you will get kudos at home and people will see, well, look, you know, this guy is being, our president is being interviewed by the, by the BBC, by the Financial Times, whoever else, so he must be pretty important. We're being taken seriously all around the world. However, of course, um, so th that, that was the first to start with, the, there was that engagement and that was a way of taking back, attempting to get more favorable coverage. Uh, the oil prices, as everyone knows in Russia, were rising significantly then. At least some of that money was spent. Um, one source told me he estimated about a million dollars a month was being spent on Western public relations advisors uh, in, in um, 2006, 2007, when they signed contracts with those uh, Western agencies to try to improve the international media coverage for Russia. Of course, since then, uh, relations have soured significantly. I want to mention a couple more incidents um, which I think uh, show the way that that has happened. Firstly, well, there was the war uh, in August 2008 with Georgia over the breakaway territory of South Ossetia. I think there was a sense then, and I was a correspondent in Moscow at the time, that Russia was, did not feel it was getting fair coverage. But it's also interesting to note that RT, which started to then, or started then, well, that was still called Russia Today, um, did not get anything like the access that the international media did. For example, um, the BBC, CNN and Sky were given interviews with the Russian foreign minister as that conflict got underway. Uh, and RT were not given anything. In fact, they were reduced to, to asking to rebroadcast some of the interviews given to the Western media. That's a situation which I think is probably all but impossible to imagine today. It might be much more likely, for example, that RT would get the exclusive and everyone would have to, to use their material. Um, so South Ossetia, I think, was one moment. And then, but there was still this attempt to engage with the Western media, whether it was through PRs or directly. Uh, but I think that era is really over. And if we think about disagreements that followed over that war in South Ossetia, disagreements over Crimea, of course, most particularly, and also Syria, not to mention um, the poisoning uh, of the Skripals uh, in Salisbury in 2018, have strained ties to the extent that I think there's no sign at the moment that things will improve. Um, and Russia now prefers very much to tell its own story by it through RT, through uh, social media, etc. And Moscow correspondents, one of the ones to whom I spoke, uh, Matthew Chance of CNN for my recent research, says that they increasingly feel as if they're treated uh, as hostile actors, a very difficult situation for them to be in. There's another story I heard uh, from a correspondent who wanted to remain nameless about when they'd done a story about the Second World War um, 
uh, which involved them getting a WhatsApp message quoting uh, uh, articles from the Russian criminal um, statutes, statutes from the Russian criminal code. In other words, the warning was, you know, you're stepping a bit close to the line uh, of things that we don't consider acceptable in, your, in, the, in the way that World War II is discussed. That, of course, has been a major article of faith right throughout the last century, you know, uh, uh, the last half of the last century, celebrating the Soviet Union's um, victory over Nazi Germany. But it's also been a, come a very important part uh, of the cousin, current Russian leadership's uh, attempts to build up the, the image of modern Russia that it wants. So to conclude, um, the Russian leadership wants to control the narratives of their domestic and international policy, policies. And the pandemic in Russia, as in many other places, has given them the opportunity to try to do that to an even greater extent. They're generally trying to keep Western correspondence at a distance. And of course, there are valid health reasons for imposing new controls on travel, but such restrictions also have a, the happy side effects for governments, um, which don't want reporters asking too many questions. So for all the discussion about how Russia, much Russia controls its narrative and the way it's able to control that narrative on social media openly uh, and less openly, reporting does still make a difference. And I think there's one big example of that back in May. Um, the angry reaction report to reports uh, in the Financial Times and New York Times in that month, su which suggested that the real figures for coronavirus uh, infections in Russia were much higher than the ones which were being made officially public. And the reaction showed that the Russian authorities cared very much about the way the country was reported and that international media still were influential. And then, of course, the Sputnik vaccine, which we read about last week. Uh, and I don't know if I'm the only one who's seen this reports earlier today saying that um, a possible vaccine for cats that may be being developed in Russia as well. Although I gather that was probably more uh, developed for mink farms, which is a very important part of the fur industry. But that will no doubt generate plenty of interest too. But for all that Russia can be a difficult and demanding country to cover, I will argue, conclude by arguing that Russian and international journalists still produce some absolutely first-rate reporting despite all those obstacles. Thank you for this ins insightful speech, James. Even I have so many questions, but we'll come to those later. So I'll just introduce our second speaker, um, Gunnar Said is a journalist and communications professional with over 15 years of experience in New York, Prague, Bratis, Bratislava and Tashkent. She has covered issues including politics, media, religion and human rights with a focus on Central Asia, Russia and Turkey. Gunnar Said is the Europe and Central Asia Program Coordinator and Committee to Protect Journalists. The title of the speech today is um, From the Foreign Agents Bill to Constitu Constitutional Amendment, Russian Media's Fight for Survival. Uh, the mic is yours. Thank you. Um, and thank you for inviting to speak at this uh, very interesting session. Uh, I'll uh, focus more on press freedom and the, the press freedom environment and the challenges journalists uh, face in Russia. Uh, since the start of the uh, pandemic, we have seen more violations of press freedom globally. Uh, authoritarian leaders have used the pandemic to cement their power even further. In Russia, uh, President Putin held a national referendum on July 1st that now allows him to stay in power for 16 more years. Uh, but I would like to take a step back for a moment and just look at uh, Russia and press freedom in Russia historically. Russia has been uh, one of the biggest violators of press freedom in the region I cover uh, and in the world. Uh, but if, uh, say, 20, 25 or 30 years ago, when we spoke about press freedom violations in Russia, we would speak about journalists being shot dead at apartment buildings they lived in, these days we see different set of challenges independent media and journalists face in Russia. We at the uh, Committee to Protect Journalists started keeping uh, the, the record, the data of journalists killed in direct uh, retaliation for their work in 1992. Uh, since 1992 in Russia, 58 journalists have been killed for doing their job and 38 of them uh, murdered. Uh, only in two murders, uh, full justice was achieved. 
which means that all perpetrators, including the masterminds, were held accountable. Only one of them was while President Putin was in power. That is the murder of Anastasia Babunova in 2009. And 33 murders still listed as murders with complete impunity, which means that no perpetrators have been brought to justice. Uh, the most recent killings happened in 2017, uh, one in St. Petersburg and the, the other in uh, Siberia, in, uh, near Tomsk. Uh, statistically, today fewer uh, journalists are killed in Russia. Why? The reason is that uh, the authorities have found other ways to gag independent media, uh, independent journalists. Murder uh, is the ultimate way to silence a journalist. It's the ultimate way of censorship. But there are other ways Russian authorities have resorted to. And efficiently so, in limiting press freedom, freedom of expression, and uh, controlling free flow of, of information in Russia. So what are those tools? Uh, I want to start with mentioning one uh, that, that is foreign agent bill. Uh, initially, as you know, the bill uh, targeted foreign organizations that the Russian authorities believed were behind color revolutions in neighboring countries, in Georgia, Ukraine, Kyrgyzstan at the time. But then later, it started being applied to foreign media outlets. Uh, the list of the foreign media outlets labeled as foreign agents today in Russia include different uh, language services and projects of Voice of America and Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. Both of those media outlets are funded by the US Congress. Uh, Russian officials were very open and adamant about the retaliatory nature of the bill when the U.S. Department of Justice requested that RT and Sputnik would be registered under the FARM, foreign agent uh, bill, uh, in the U.S. and be labeled as foreign agent. The Russian officials said they would mirror uh, the, the request uh, as they did. A um, foreign agent bill is the way to censor the information that's been delivered to Russian audiences by foreign media outlets, particularly the U.S. media outlets. Uh, but censorship is not a new phenomenon in Russia, as you understand. Actually, Russia has a censorship organ uh, called Roskomnadzor. Uh, it's a government agency that fulfills the role of a censorship organ. It orders uh, blocking websites, web pages, individual articles or video reports. Uh, and this practice is not limited only to blocking content such as, say, child pornography or extremist organizations that are officially banned in Russia. This practice is clearly uh, a censorship because Rostomnadzor doesn't allow the information that doesn't fall within the Kremlin-approved narrative. For example, Ukraine is a big uh, contesting issue, or these days it's the information on Belarus, uh, on the protests against the Lukashenko regime in Belarus. Uh, Rostomnadzor also has uh, uh, issues licenses to media outlets, and uh, apply censorship when doing or not doing so. For example, the websites or uh, outlets that Alexei Navalny or, or Mikhail Khodorkovsky, the opposition uh, figures started uh, and uh, tried to register uh, in Russia. Uh, they, they failed to do so because uh, Roskomnadzor, as I said, uh, did not allow them to do so and did not issue the, the licenses. Um, also, Roskomnadzor has attempted to block entire web platforms like LinkedIn or force some social media platforms or the messaging apps like Telegram to store user data in Russia, which uh, those uh, platforms refuse to do. Uh, in general, these practices and legislations, uh, in other words, institutionalized censorship, came very handy when the pandemic started. 
Uh, as you know, a few months ago, Russia was slightly behind some countries in Europe in the spread of the coronavirus, but then as COVID-19 spilled over to Russia, the authorities started uh, cracking down on independent reporting on the pandemic. Uh, in March, we at the, the Committee to Protect Journalists documented how journalists and media outlets were targeted for independently reporting on COVID-19. In one instance, uh, Roskomnadzor ordered a uh, well-known radio station, Echo Masli, uh, and another uh, news website, Gavarit Magadan, to remove articles uh, on COVID. Uh, in case of Echo Masli, it was an interview with, a, with an expert on the virus. The expert compared the pandemic in Russia to how uh, the Russian authorities handled the Chernobyl disaster. Uh, for Gavarit Magadan, it was a report about the death of a local man from a pneumonia in a local hospital. Uh, we also reported on physical threats to journalists when uh, in April, uh, you, may, you may remember how Chechen leader Ramzan Kadyrov threatened a uh, correspondent of Nova Gazeta, Yelena Milashina, and the Kremlin officials sided with Ramzan Kadyrov and not with the journalists. Uh, as the government introduced a uh, lockdown, we have seen more limitations for journalists throughout the country. Uh, Russian authorities prosecuted journalists on false news charges for reports that deviated from the Kremlin approved narrative on COVID-19. They opened crim criminal cases against journalists, imposed fines and ordered to remove reports, as I mentioned. We also documented how difficult it became for journalists to get information, even official information, uh, and gain access to government buildings and official events like press briefings on the pandemic. Uh, we interviewed a journalist who works for Medusa and uh, several other media outlets as a freelancer, and he told us how he covered the pandemic in North Caucasus, in Dagestan, Chechnya, and uh, Karachay, Cherkessia. Uh, and what he told us was that he was not able to get an official information from hospitals or municipalities. And he had to talk to individual doctors, but at some point those doctors even because they received the instructions from above, they, they, they refused to talk to journalists. Um, the goal of the Russian authorities was to contain the information as the country was approaching the July 1st referendum. Uh, if you remember, the referendum was initially scheduled for spring, but because of the pandemic, it was rescheduled and uh, eventually Putin got his uh, terms extended or rather, you know, got, got the right to be reelected more. Uh, and after the vote, uh, Russian authorities started a full scale offensive on independent media, detaining journalists, accusing media of fake news, bringing the treason charges against the well-known uh, journalist Ivan Safronov, for example, many journalists protested against the charges against Safronov and were detained uh, and charged. Um, also, uh, one other criterion to look at uh, when we speak about press freedom environment uh, in a country is the number of journalists jailed for their work. Uh, in the region of Europe and Central Asia that I cover for CPJ, Russia remains one of the biggest jailers of journalists. When we conducted the most recent prison census in December last year, there were seven journalists behind bars. That number remains uh, almost the same with now Safronov in jail. Uh, one of them, for example, a journalist of uh, independent uh, newspaper Chernavik in Makhachkala, Dagestan, uh, Abdumumin Gadriev has been in detention in Makhachkala on absurd charges for over a year now, and there is no uh, date of trial set. Uh, another uh, one is uh, Rashid Maisigov, who uh, also in the Caucasus, who first was put in prison last year, then released under house arrest, and has been unfree uh, for over a year now. And four of those journalists in jail are 
Crimean journalists detained in Rostov-na-Donu, Rostov-on-Don, or in Crimea. Uh, and we include them in the Russia section of our prison census because it is the Russian authorities who jailed them. Uh, so if we look at the uh, press freedom environment in Russia and uh, in larger region, uh, and, 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 and if we try to look into the immediate future, uh, what is next, uh, in my opinion, is that authoritarianism, well, it has been on, on the rise in recent years globally, and overall we are witnessing the erosion of democratic institutions in Eastern Europe and the rest of the socialist bloc. Uh, and this process is likely to continue. For example, last month, OSCE's two representatives, one on human rights and the other one on media freedom, did not get their mandates extended. Yeah. And in Russia, uh, as I said, authoritarianism grows stronger we are likely to see more attempts to silence journalists and control the internet. Uh, at the same time, I would say that there is a silver lining. Uh, there are new media outlets, startups. Some of them have been run from abroad, uh, such as Medusa, The Bell, Project. And also there are younger bloggers who produce uh, blogs on YouTube. There are new channels with thousands of sub subscribers on Telegram. Uh, I think we would, will not see the Cold War type uh, censorship, like full blanket censorship anymore in Russia. I, I, I remain optimistic. I think younger Russians want to have free and accessible information. The internet is their main platform. They are not, they are not, um, the audience of the main TV channels that still remain under 100% control of the Kremlin. Uh, they don't want to succumb to the state propaganda. And also one uh, thing that makes me more uh, optimistic about the future of Russian journalism is uh, the solidarity among journalists themselves. The case of Ivan Zolno from last year, you may remember it very well when a lot of uh, Russian journalists and other members of the R Russian society came in support of Ivan Zelenov and he was released very quickly after being detained on some trumped up charges. Uh, most recently, uh, it is the case of Svetlana Prokopieva, the journalist uh, from Pskov in Western Russia, and Ivan Safronov, uh, as I mentioned, and also the case of Abdul Mumin Gajib in Dagestan, where a lot of journalists also uh, demonstrate incredible, incredible solidarity in defending their uh, co-workers. Uh, I think I'll stop here and uh, I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you so much. That was a very educational presentation. Um, we'll take questions later. So um, now I'll go to the last speaker for the rest of the session and that be Sofia Oloski. Um, she is a senior program manager at Freedom House. Prior to joining Freedom House, Sophia was based in Moscow with various local Russian NGOs and later with the National Democratic Institute for International Relations, designing and conducting immersion training for civic activists, local government officials and political party members on various aspects of civic engagement and political participation. As the senior program manager in charge of Eurasia's, Sophia's mind should be busy with Belarus nowadays. So we are very thankful for her accept we are very thankful to her for accepting our invitation at such a hectic time. And for today's speech, um, she will be talking about the spread of an infodemic, Russian influence on non-Russian conventional and social media. So the mic is yours. Thank you so much. And the remarks I prepared are more or less narrowly focused on the situation around the pandemic. Um, obviously, there is a lot to say about Russia's influence on traditional and social media in general through various disinformation tools. I uh, would like to direct your attention and encourage you to read a very recent report by uh, released by the uh, Global Engagement Center in the US on the pillars of Russian disinformation. I think it's fairly comprehensive. Um, there's also a lot that has been written um, through uh, 
by various think tanks and investigative reporting outlets, as well as um, government agencies in Europe in in the US. So, but in terms of how the Russian government has been using uh, media and social media space to spread uh, disinformation or alternative narratives or limit the objective narratives during the pandemic. Uh, Gulnaz already mentioned a number of things um, uh, among the punitive measures, um, but I want to make a few general points and, and, and kind of go into three um, strategies that we're observing um, utilized by the Russian government to control the spread of the information about the pandemic and then um, offer some of my thoughts on the effects um, of these tactics. Um, in general, yes, the Russian government has not been interested in providing truthful information about the both the coronavirus and the spread of the pandemic inside the country, as well as and probably most importantly, uh, institutional preparedness to handle such a giant public health crisis because it was drastically unprepared. Um, the general approach early on was either to ignore or downplay the severity of the pandemic. There were a number of narratives also on the uh, etymology of the pandemic and the sources and that it was imported and lots of various conspiracy theories about how, um, but ultimately uh, the what we saw early on in the late uh, winter and early spring was kind of a complete um, dismissal of the problem, um, more uh, and even more so acknowledgement of the lack of resources and managerial preparedness to respond to a public health crisis. Although reports of unusual um, health issues and respiratory illnesses began surfacing in social media very early on, uh, even in December, and Russia's proximity, uh, proximity and also trade relations and travel to China are actually, um, you know, very conducive to person-to-person uh, -person contact. So um, once um, information started being reported uh, worldwide and international media, especially about uh, this unknown new virus and the effects it's having on public health, we saw that um, there was chatter coming up uh, through social media, through WhatsApp groups, Telegram channels, um, among just ordinary people saying, I had this very weird uh, pneumonia or very severe respiratory illness with weird symptoms that I had never experienced before. And um, this was definitely very noticeable, but uh, government did not acknowledge any. Um, anything um, kind of at, at the central level. Uh, at the national level, Putin and the health ministry officials repeatedly brushed off the responsibility for managing the crisis and kind of delegated it to regional heads. And uh, most likely it was done to diminish their own accountability in, in the eyes of the public, um, especially early on when so little was known about the um, the nature of the virus um, and this way, if anything went wrong, uh, it could be local governors, regional governors who could be blamed for the mismanagement of the crisis, but not the national leadership. And ultimately, this strategy of denial comes with a very strong need to manage the flow of information in support of the official narrative. And here I um, group the the strategy and the, the tactics and the strategy in kind of three broad categories. One is punitive measures. Um, second one is limiting public access to objective content. And third is forcing an alternative narrative that supports the government's point of view and, and version of the events. And so um, we talked a little bit about the punitive measures and um, obviously uh, cracking down on journalists and using various administrative and criminal procedures to gag them and their ability to write as well as limiting their access to data uh, or access to uh, buildings, whether it's hospitals or uh, government uh, offices. 
is one way. There was also a um, new law that had been passed very quickly at the onset of the pandemic, the so-called law on fake news that uh, targets individuals and outlets with a punishment of up to, up to five years in prison and um, a very hefty fine, um, which I would say is around $25,000, $30,000, I guess that would be closer to, what, 15, 20,000 um, pounds. And essentially it uh, opens up a possibility of criminal persecution of individuals who share information that can be uh, creating a threat that endangers people's lives or can be construed uh, as a violation of public uh, health order or um, can be construed as a violation of public security or can damage somebody's health. The interpretation can be very broad. And so under this law, uh, the authorities find um, number of people and there were at least 200 criminal cases that were started according to the um, human rights group Agora um, and uh, they were uh, targeting very ordinary individuals who are using social networks uh, to post about cases they knew especially early on there were cases uh, there were um, cases started uh, targeting either medical professionals or individuals who were posting about friends or relatives who have access to uh, data or work in medical institutions and were just saying how atrocious the situation was in the red zones of those hospitals. Um, there um, th there was also, um, I believe uh, James mentioned that, uh, you know, the the restrictions on travel and just in general restric restrictions related to quarantine um, were one of those um, similar ways, uh, a very kind of punitive way to uh, limit the spread of information because of just how easily and eagerly the government was fining people for violation of the so-called quarantine regime. And um, there were at least 54,000 fines um, and quite honestly this whole uh, quarantine business has turned out um, pretty profitable. Um, so in April and June uh, there were close to 14 million dollars in quarantine related fines um, and obviously the government doesn't want any transparency on this but as we know the Russian uh, rent seeking um, government structure is trying to use any opportunity at finding citizens to generate more revenue. Um, the second, the second category of measures is limiting foreign content and um, therefore limiting the access of uh, ordinary citizens to objective information. And uh, here we saw, it, it, uh, I mean, it's an ongoing battle. You probably know that there is um, a, an ongoing assault on certain foreign media by designating them as media foreign agents, um, which uh, now uh, forces these media to put a ginormous disclaimer on every single publication that this media outlet is a foreign agent and ultimately is meant to uh, discredit the, these outlets and, and humiliate um, them in the eyes of media consumers. Um, this kind of comes in handy uh, during uh, this particular time because it's something that was already on the books. But we also saw a particular attempt by the Russian government to um, respond to foreign media publications about the state of um, uh, Russian healthcare and, and the state of the pandemic inside the country. For example, Roskomnadzor uh, demanded from Google that it block uh, Financial Times articles on Russian websites. And um, that's one of the ways to do, uh, to limit foreign content. Uh, 
and I guess the the third uh, the third general um, category of of responses was to push forward deliberately um, pro government narratives, and here again, this is very well documented as part of a much bigger problem that um, we observe with regards on um, to Russia's government influence on information flow worldwide. Um, and here, uh, with regards to COVID-19 and the pandemic, uh, we have observed a few things. Um, there, uh, there is a mixture of narratives, and it depends on um, the target audience, whether it's domestic or uh, external, European primarily. But inside the country, um, the main line is essentially asserting at this point, after uh, weeks and months of denial at this point, there's an assertion that uh, Russian government is very deliberately and calmly succeeding and fighting the virus. Um, there's well documented, uh, there, uh, there's very well documented suppression of official statistics um, and um, kind of the daily reported uh, new cases or totals have plateaued at some point, and there is a number of uh, investigative reporting that has been done um, to show that this is inconsistent with most trends um, and therefore is suspicious. Um, there is a narrative line that uh, European and also U.S. governments are uh, are lost, that they're creating mass hysteria, that they're making mistakes and um, losing the trust of their um, people. Um, and therefore, um, Russian government essentially has an advantage because it it's handling the situation so well in its own country and know it knows what it's doing. And now, as we know, there was this uh, very broad announcement that a first vaccine was registered in Russia. Um, and then uh, we're also seeing narratives that um, the Russian government is kind of um, selectively or uh, benevolently offering partnership um, in handling the crisis. And we saw it more in kind of not free environments um, rather than democracies um, by offering equipment. Um, you remember probably there was a scandal uh, about a, a shipment of um, ventilators um, to the United States, for example, that later turned out to be faulty. Uh, and there was very little, if any, coverage of that uh, in Russian media, but um, it was covered pretty well in the US. Um, and in general, Russian government uh, peddles this narrative externally that if, if um, foreign nations are open to collaboration, it's very eager to provide assistance in fighting uh, the coronavirus pandemic. And obviously there are more nuanced things and there's always a, uh, an anti-Ukrainian narrative present and um, almost at any opportunity, there is very um, drastic criticism of how, for example, Ukraine is handling the pandemic and things like that. Uh, but ultimately, we can boil it down to this, um, uh, the, uh, the general line that Russia has its own way of finding the pandemic and it's the right way. And so I guess um, I'll conclude with a few notes on whether this has been uh, effective at all or not. Um, all these punitive measures and alternative narratives and here we're seeing kind of a dual effect, I would say, and it depends on which part of society we're looking at, whether it's civil society um, and what we call the grass tops or the general public. Many ordinary citizens who continue to consume um, state-run TV channels and state-run media continue to be nonchalant about the pandemic and about the protective measures and don't necessarily believe in the pandemic um, or believe in kind of these conspiracy theories uh, that are being pushed through various um, pro-government and um, alternative channels. However, 
at the civil society level and at the grass tops level, we're observing a, um, a very strong mobilization of resources despite all efforts of the Russian government. Um, medical professionals were the first ones to sound alarm about the critical situation in the hospitals while state media were silent. Um, and uh, the whole fake news um, law was likely in part a response to these um, uh, reports uh, bubbling up through social networks from the people who had firsthand knowledge of what's happening inside the hospitals. Uh, there are several independent um, outlets that ran extensive coverage of the pandemic inside Russia, reporting from the red zones and the hospitals, and um, it's Novaya Gazeta and Taki Line and a number of others, uh, all efforts to suppress uh, free media and suppress free speech, but uh, that coverage was unprecedented, um, very robust, um, very daring. Um, and certain medical officials and high level officials, the hospitals that were designated to be treated 19 patients uh, were coming forward and speaking very openly uh, about access to resources and availability of support from the state. Uh, civil society and citizens organized to uh, provide assistance to hospitals to bring food, uh, to bring protective gear, um, while nothing was coming from the health ministry um, or other official sources. And there were also efforts um, to, come, uh, to pull together information on the medical professionals who, had, um, who have died as a result of exposure to COVID-19 um, and it actually uh, amassed, um, the last I saw, it was close to 500 names across Russia um, that was being continuously verified. And the Russian officials denounced it and, of course, proclaimed it was all disinformation and untrue. Um, and in general, I guess uh, there was also a very interesting uh, movement on behalf of lawyers. Uh, who from the very beginning, from mid-March, started noticing the effects of um, the government's spread, uh, the government's reaction to the spread of the virus um, and its effect on um, workers, on their labor rights, effect, uh, the effect on uh, medical professionals and the various gag rules and whatnot, and uh, lawyers um, organized the support and, and intake of um, complaints and provision of this legal assistance fairly quickly and have reported on it very openly. And so in a sense, what we see is that despite all these punitive measures, despite all the denial or the pushing of alternative narratives, the society of Russia is very resilient and, and people understand that it's important to provide truthful information um, at a time of crisis um, and uh, ensure that this information gets to as many people as possible. So overall, we would say that society prevails um, over all possible restrictions. Yes, it takes time, it takes energy, uh, it takes endurance, um, but it's definitely possible. And I'll stop here. Thank you, Sophie. I think you made some very important and interesting points. Um, so now we'll just go to the Q&A session. And as I've already said, you can ask your questions by raising your hand or you can use the chat box. So I'll just start my question to Dr. James. Um, so my question is, um, you've also highlighted that um, Russia is spreading false hope and claiming that they have a vaccine. And I've read it somewhere that uh, countries such as India, Brazil, and Saudi Arabia have actually shown interest in purchasing this vaccination for the um, COVID-19. So I was thinking, how will this benefit Russia? And also, like, because these countries, they show interest knowing that the data Russia has are, like, not really true. So I was just thinking, could this create a sort of, like, power balances in the international system and, like, a kind of different, like, alliances between states? Well, I think whichever country finally 
you know, it produces a vaccine that actually works. It's going to be a massive, it's going to be a great source of rejoicing right around the world, but it's also going to be a big soft power triumph for that country too. Uh, and which is why, I mean, I'm not an expert on it, but I do know that it seems very surprising that uh, the Russian vaccine is advanced as they say it is. Uh, and from the reports I've read from people who do understand these things far better than I, it seems that they're just not as far advanced. They've just sort of declared, a tr they've declared success and it may well lead to success, but they've declared success uh, before many other scientists would have chosen to do so. But it's a reflection of the fact that, as I say, this is going to be a huge soft power triumph because whichever country does invent the vaccine, and you might remember those reports from uh, last month that um, at the same time as Russia was trying to buy the uh, vaccine or buy access or agree manufacturing deals with the vaccine, which was uh, hopefully going to be produced at the University of Oxford, it was also reported to be trying to the Russian hackers were trying to break into British Research Institute's computers. So there's a, the race is really, really on. Um, but of course, uh, in the same way, there'll be a big soft power triumph to, to, to bring a vaccine to market that either proved not to work or to be harmful would conversely be a real disaster. So it's very difficult. Um, but, you know, Sophia said this is part of, you know, proving to the uh, domestic audience in particular and from the examples you've given also to the international one we're getting this right and you know what most other people aren't so it's, it's part of building that very important narrative thank you so i'll just go to the next question uh tuba timur has a question um so you can just go forward oh hello um, first of all, I want to thank to all of the speakers for this informative seminar. Um, I have a question for Sofia. Given that Belarus is a hot topic and also that Russian influence in all the East European countries is obvious, um, can you brief us on how the situation in Belarus is? I've heard rumors that no Belarusian uh, journalist is willing to speak to international channels for fear of persecution in Belarus. Um, is it true and how much Russia is implicated in the development? Thank you. Well, we would need a whole other day to talk about Belarus. Uh, and I see Gulnaza is shaking her head. Um, well, of course, of course, it's not true. Uh, Belarus and to foreign journalists and this is happening. And if you would like to follow Belarus, please uh, go on Twitter, on Facebook. There's a number of outstanding reporters um, inside Belarus who are um, posting constant updates in English um, as well as in other languages. Um, in general, the situation is fluid. I mean, for the purpose of our seminar here, um, the, the protests in Belarus are genuine and um, organic, let's put it this way. Uh, there have been no pro-Russia or anti-Russia, uh, what is it called, uh, speeches or demands or anything like that. Uh, Belarusian people want freedom for themselves. That This is a historical point at which they're trying to determine their own um, right to choose the their elected leaders and so this is a very it's a purely domestic issue and i honestly very much dislike and resist bringing russia into this and and looking at what's happening in belarus through the russia angle um however the the interesting part about belarus in terms of free speech and covid has been that um the outgoing president alexander lukashenko um, just denied for months and months the presence of the virus inside the country um, and uh, failed to uh, uh, provide any resources to state institutions um, to fight the pandemic. So we saw an unprecedented rise in civic organizing to respond to this crisis, which in part kind of dismantled uh, certain aspects of self-censorship just because people were uh, donating, people were volunteering, people were sharing information about opportunities to get engaged, providing information. We saw that also happening um, in hospitals where hospitals started uh, 
issuing essentially official thank you letters to the various volunteering campaigns that were bringing food and PPE um, and whatnot. So the situation is very fluid. Everybody, of course, hopes for a, a peaceful democratic outcome. Um, I strongly encourage you to follow it. It's incredibly fascinating. Um, we haven't ha we haven't seen anything like that happen in Europe for a very long time. Um, but I, I would I would be I would caution you against uh, trying to find a Russia angle on um, invitations to freedom of uh, expression and speech that exists in Belarus at the hands of Belarusian government. Thank you. Um, if there's anything you wish to add, uh, Dunaza, we would like to hear on this question. Yes, thank you. I would I would respond to the part uh, about the Russian journalists not speaking to foreign media. We've been speaking to a lot of journalists on the ground, and yesterday we published a, a very powerful interview with a female journalist who works for Bill Sat, an independent broadcaster in Belarus. She was detained for three days last week, and she ended up in a hospital because of the injuries she sustained while in detention. It's a very powerful interview. I invite you to read that. Uh, it's published both in English and Russian. Uh, and we've seen many, dozens of journalists who have been detained in the run up to the elections, on the election day, and also during the uh, post election protests. Uh, today, I got a, a, a tiny good news from our partners on the ground, the Belarusian Association of Journalists, that the last journalist in detention was released today. Uh, the most up-to-date number was 68 journalists in detention at some point, uh, and uh, we are very happy to see that change. And also, we've seen uh, even journalists working for state-owned media outlets being on strike. So even if you look at the, the state uh, TV, you can see empty desks and background music and some running uh, what they did yesterday and it became viral, I think, on, on social media is the line that tries the horoscope and every zodiac sign is encouraged to fight for their rights or for their wishes, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, we were told that it was a sort of a sabotage uh, from one of the technicians in that state broadcaster uh, who is supportive of the protests and protesters. But also uh, some of the uh, employees of state-owned uh, media outlets have been speaking to foreign media outlets. The BBC ran a, an interview uh, yesterday morning with one of them. So if you look for our interviews of the Russian journalists, you will definitely find uh, different interviews. Thank you. And also, um, the interview you just mentioned is in the chat box. So anyone who is interested to look at it, feel free to do so. And so next, um, Asiya Betul also has a question. Um, you can go for it. Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself for a second. Thank you very much, Mirai. So I would like to ask this question to Gulnoza. So you said that you're optimistic about the future of Russian journalism because of the solidarity of journalists in Russia, but could we also have trust in the EU and take an action against Russia's human rights violations? Or is that not even a possibility, do you think? Well, I'm, uh, sorry, I'm particularly, particularly thinking of the Magnitsky Act, maybe? That's a very good question, thank you. I, I tell you uh, one thing. I've been working on many countries in the region of Europe and Central Asia, and it also includes Turkey, and there was a Turkey session before this one, and I listened to some of the speeches at the end. Um, uh, Russia is one of the most difficult countries in terms of advocacy. Uh, very few parties have enough leverage to influence the decision making in the Kremlin uh, in, in, in Moscow. Uh, the EU 
uh, is one party that also has somewhat limited uh, opportunities in terms of advocacy with Russia. I, I give you an example. We, uh, as CPJ, uh, I'm not sure I, I can I can hear someone speaking. Uh, we at CPJ are, are uh, a member organization of the Council of Europe platform uh, on the safety of journalists, and we. Uh, upload all the alerts we issue on the member countries of the Council of Europe and Russia is one of them, as you know, and Russian authorities practically never respond to any alerts. There are governments that respond on a regular basis. These uh, member states have to respond. This is their obligation because they are members of the Council of Europe, which is different from the EU, as you understand but I'm giving this as an example. And Russia never responds. Russian uh, authorities get, uh, I think, annoyed when uh, organizations like CPJ issue statements uh, criticizing these or that incident uh, regarding press freedom or human rights in general. And they have been trying to limit their uh, interaction unless they can show the interaction with certain organizations, including ours, as the way to legitimize their own stance. We at CPJ have a, a somewhat unique relationship with Russian officials. Uh, I myself met with representatives of Russian Foreign Ministry here in New York. Uh, uh, you know, they're um, when they were visiting or the, their, the Russian diplomats from the embassy or from the, uh, their uh, office in the United Nations here in New York. And this is also, uh, you know, interesting uh, relationship because we can uh, send them information and also uh, request for, uh, you know, more information on certain press freedom violations in Russia and uh, there is a dialogue, but I wouldn't say that it's a constructive dialogue that usually leads to some change uh, in terms of press freedom in Russia. Um, I hope that answered your question. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, with this question, I will close this session and thank you all um, for giving your time and uh, joining us on this event.